So I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Lucas Farnan. Uh, he is coming from uh, Dr. Patrick Kramer's lab at the Max Planck, and he has actually been in his labs uh, as a po as a PhD student, and soon he's going to be starting his own lab at Harvard Medical School. So that's going to be really exciting um, in January, I believe. So if you're uh, looking for a new lab to join, you can. Uh, email Lucas and uh, ask about positions once everything gets sorted out with moving and uh, U.S. Uh, immigration. So without further, without further more introduction, I will go ahead and let uh, Lucas start his talk. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really great to be here. And I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. Also, thank you already for the free adverti uh, advertisement. And um, today I will be presenting my work on POL2 and CP complexes, as well as work on the CHD family of chromatin remodelers. But before I go into the nitty gritty detail, I just want to point out how fascinating I find it personally that a single cell can develop into a full grown organism. And this of course requires intricate regulation of gene expression at all levels of the central dogma. And I'm especially interested in the first step of the central dogma where RNA polymerases transcribe the genomic information into RNA molecules. And while of course the central dogma is very beautiful in its simplicity, the devil is as always in the details. And this becomes evident when we just consider the DNA, for example. Eukaryotic DNA in the nucleus has to play quite conflicted roles. On one hand, eukaryotic cells need to accommodate their large genomes in the tight confinements of the nucleus to protect it from detrimental effects. So compaction is required. But at the same time, the organism also needs to access its genetic information to replicate their genome, to transcribe RNA. And if it occurs, also, of course, repair DNA damage. So these processes, in contrast, all require access to DNA. And as you can imagine, this is quite a dramatic logistical problem. So the big question is, how are these interests of compaction and accessibility realized in eukaryotes? And luckily, evolution has come up with this uh, protein nucleic acid complex that we all know called uh, chromatin that allows both for the compaction as well as controlled accessibility when required. And I think this also becomes evident in this electron micrograph of this interface nucleus where we see regions with high levels of compaction, typically called heterochromatin, and regions of a lower local concentration of chromatin that we classically call euchromatin. But I think while we're here still on a semi-macro scale, it's important to stress that the fundamental nuclear processes, such as um, DNA repair, transcription, and DNA replication, all happen at nanometer scales. And all of these machineries are actually facing the fundamental unit of chromatin, which is, of course, the nucleosome. But because the interactions between the histones and the DNA is so extensive, the nucleosome is also quite a formidable barrier to, pro to these processes, such as transcription. And the cell then has to employ molecular motors, so-called chromatin remodelers, to modulate the nucleosomal landscape. And generally speaking, we divide the activity of chromatin remodelers into three distinct categories. First, nucleosome assembly and spacing, um, pro chromatin access, and then third, uh, histone exchange. And we can then use these different activities, as well as the subunit and domain composition, to um, subdivide the remodelers into four subfamilies, which are known as I-switch, CHD, switch sniff, and the ENO80 families. But despite their differences, um, all of these chromatin remodelers are molecular motors. They're ATPases that can translocate DNA. And um, this involves lobes um, that are shown here. And both of these lobes track along the same strand of DNA where one lobe sits slightly ahead of the other one. And upon ATP hydrolysis, these motors can then move and facilitate the translocation of the DNA as shown in this beautiful render here by Janet Iwasa. But the chromatin remodelers have not only these two lobes, um, these two domains, they also carry additional regulatory domains or even four multi subunit complexes to move the nucleosomal barrier. So I wanted to understand at a mechanistic level how these chromatin remodelers work and how they are regulated. And the most approachable target at the time was the CHD family of remodelers because they are involved in transcription, which is one of my interests. And additionally, most of its members are single subunit chromatin remodelers and in the yeast 
Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the CHD family has only one member, CHD1. Um, CHD1 has a very modular domain architecture, again, with this centrally located log one and log two of the ATPs motor, around which regulatory domains are arranged, namely a double chromo domain at the end terminus and a DNA binding region consisting out of a sand and a slide domain on the C terminus. So from a structural perspective, it's really an ideal model system to study the process of chromatin remodeling. Specifically, I wanted to understand how CHD1 engages the nucleosome, what functions the, regula the regulatory domains have, and also learn a little bit more about the mechanism of DNA translocation. And because crystallization of nucleosome factor complexes are notoriously difficult, I employed single particle cryo-EM. I collected a data set with approximately 4,000 micrographs and had about a million particles in the data. And then subsequent to declassification revealed a nucleosome-like structure um, that you can see here in these 2D um, classes with some additional density, which is CHG1. And I, from this then, obtained a, re a 3D reconstruction of the NCP CHG1 complex at a nominal resolution of approximately 4.6 angstrom. And I could then use this reconstruction to build a model of the nucleosome CHD1 complex based on crystal structures from the nucleosome, the uh, crystal structures of the DNA binding region, as well as providing additional de novo modeling, modeling. And what you can see here is that CHD1 interacts quite extensively with DNA on one side of the nucleosome. Specifically, CHD1 binds with its ATPs motor at superhelical location plus two, while the double chromo domain shown here uh, contacts superhelical location plus one via a basic patch interaction. But the most striking feature that we found was really that CHD1 induces a non-canonical nucleosome core particle conformation, where the DNA binding region binds the opposite DNA gyre and then seems to stabilize unwrapping of two full helical turns of nucleosomal DNA. And to visualize this, we have here modeled a canonical nucleosome with a little bit of extra nucleosomal DNA. And we can then morph into my structure. And I think you can appreciate quite easily the dramatic change the DNA undergoes um, in the CHD1 structure. In fact, the DNA changes its trajectory by about 60 degrees. And this seems to be the signature rearrangement of CHD1. And one can, of course, then speculate from there and um, propose that the rearrangement in the DNA, it could destabilize the nucleosome and then later on allow for higher efficiency once the tightly regulated process of remodeling takes place. So this is the overall architecture of CHD1. But we also want to understand how the auxiliary domains contribute to the regulation of the ATPase motor. And um, to understand or address this question, um, a 10-year-old crystal structure from the Bowman lab um, helped us tremendously. This crystal structure captured the ATPase motor with the double chromo domain in an inhibited state where the chromo domain sequesters slope two, and we have modeled this state here onto our structure. And I can now show you that upon binding of CHD1 to the nucleosome, the double chromo domain interacts with superhelical location plus one and recognizes the nucleosomal DNA. And this swinging of the double chromo domain relieves a basic patch on ATPase slope two. The ATP slope two can then, because it's freed from the double chromo domain, close and actively engage the nucleosome at superhelical location plus two and bind ATP to start its remodeling activity. So taking everything together and integrating this also with already available biochemical data, as well as structural observations from other chromatin remodelers, we can now propose a model where the nucleosome CHD1 structure provides a framework for understanding general mechanisms of chromatin remodeling. The idea is that upon nucleosome binding, the double chromo domain releases the ATP slopes, as I mentioned already, and then cycles of ATP hydrolysis lead to a movement of the ATP motor in one direction while shifting DNA towards the diet. And this then ultimately pulls DNA in from the opposite side and makes the DNA longer on the proximal side where CHD1 binds, ultimately um, then resulting in chromatin remodeling. So this is the idea about the NCP CHD1 structure. But interestingly, whereas in Cerevisia, the CHD family has only one member, it has undergone quite a dramatic expansion in humans where the CHD family has a total of nine members. 
And these nine members are categorized in three subfamilies and were able to acquire or exchange certain auxiliary domains. So I wanted to understand how evolution of one member in specific, CHD4 from subfamily two, um, shows a different remodeling activity, for example, compared to CHD1. CHD4 is, especially interest, is an especially interesting target because it is implicated in heterochromatin formation and maintenance, which is, of course, significantly different from CHD1, which is a transcription elongation factor. And additionally, CHD4 is also part of multi-subunit complexes, including the NERD complex, as well as the recently discovered CHAP complex. So again, employing CryEM, we were able to obtain the structure of a single copy and two copies of CHD4 bound to a mononucleosome. And the single copy of CHD4 bound to the NCP is, as, at least as far as I know, the, to date the highest resolution structure of any chromatin remodeler um, on a nucleosomal substrate. And overall, you can already see here that CHD4 shows a very conserved um, structural architecture compared to CHD1, again, with ATPase lobes at superhelical location plus two, double chromodomain at plus one, and then the PhD finger, which is an extra axillary domain closer to the diet here shown in this um, pink color. But the most striking difference, of course, is that CHD4 is not able to unravel nucleosomal DNA from the histone octopair which I think is consistent with its role in heterochromatin maintenance. But in my experimental setup, there was a minor inconsistency because I had used AMP PNP to trap CHD4 and ADP beryllium fluoride to trap CHD1. So it still wasn't clear if maybe these ATP analogs are responsible for inducing these changes in the unraveling of the nucleosomal DNA. So to address this, I established a FRET assay to monitor the process of unraveling um, and to verify if indeed CHD4 is responsible for the difference in the DNA trajectory or if it is rather due to the different ATP analogs. And the FRET assay that I employed uses two FRET probes that are on either side of the nucleosome. And we can then excite the donor and measure the emission from both the donor and the acceptor probe. And this is plotted here on the right in this graph for a nucleosomal set without any chromatin model bound. And we could then expect an increase in the donor emission and a decrease in the acceptor emission when CHD1 is bound, because the distances between the probes will increase due to the unraveling of the nucleosomal DNA. And indeed, this is the case both for ADP beryllium fluoride as well as for AMP PMP. However, for CHD4, the emission spectra does not change when compared, uh, when compared to the control giving clear evidence that CHD4 does not unravel the nucleosome, as we had observed also in our structure. And to summarize this, this is then also consistent with the, with the roles of these different CHD chromatin remodelers, where CHD1 acts as a transcription initiation and elongation factor that acts mostly in euchromatin, whereas CHD4 is implicated in heterochromatin maintenance, where unraveling and destabilization of nucleosome compaction is unfavorable. So chromatin remodelers are able to lower the barrier that the sometimes not so fragile nucleosomes represent um, to, for example, the transcription machinery. But on top of understanding chromatin remodelers, I was also very much interested in looking at how the transcription machinery deals with the nucleosome. And to do that, I designed a minimal system for the study of RNA polymerase II nucleosome complexes with the basic idea that one would position the polymerase in front of the nucleosome and then let it transcribe into the nucleosome by the addition of NTPs. And a first indication that this might work gave an RNA extension assay uh, with RNA polymerase II where it was quite evident that POL2 can transcribe for a little bit into the nucleosome, but is then blocked and can only precisely transcribe into the nucleosome up until the superhelical location minus five. We then purified this complex by size exclusion and applied it to cryem and were able to obtain a structure at 4.4 angstrom. And here you can see RNA polymerase two in a post translocated elongation state with the nucleosome being positioned downstream of the polymerase. And surprisingly, the nucleosome is also set in a precise position when it is approached by POL2. And this is probably due to contacts of the clamp hat domain of RNA polymerase one and of RNA polymerase two and the lobe domain of RPV2 with the nucleosomal DNA close to the diet. And 
this finding is especially exciting because the RPV1 clamp head is not evolutionary conserved in bacteria and only seems to have developed in the presence of chromatin. So the clamp head did not have a clear function previously, but now with observing this interaction with the nucleosome, we can assign a role for this domain in the context of chromatin transcription. But the Pol2 and uh, Pol2 NCP and CHD1 NCP structure now also allows us to make predictions based on both structures. And when we overlay CHD1 onto the Pol2 NCP structure, it becomes evident that the DNA binding region here shown in this hot pink color can no longer be accommodated. But it has been shown biochemically that this placement of the DNA binding region has been uh, increases the ATPase rates of CHD1. And this is then also consistent with the model that I showed earlier for chromatin remodeling and the directionality of it. So one could imagine that CHD1 could pump DNA towards polymerase facilitating transcription. So by um, incorporating biochemical, biophysical, as well as the structural data that we have, we can really use integrated structural biology to understand basic mechanisms of nuclear biology um, that are at the intersection of chromatin and transcription. And just for like the last, for my last two slides, I want to quickly switch gears and also um, have a little bit more advertisement here. And again, announce that I will be uh, joining, uh, that I will be opening my own lab in January, 2021 at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Cell Biology. And I'm looking for postdocs that are interested in working on chromatin and uh, transcription. And uh, with this, I just, want to quickly acknowledge funding sources and my colleagues in Göttingen. I want to thank my supervisor, Patrick, and my closest collaborator on a number of projects, Seychelle Foss, who is now an assistant professor at MIT, who also worked on the Pol2 NCP structure together with me, and um, the team of researchers I work currently with. And I want to especially point out Moritz, who worked uh, with me on the CHD4 story. And I thank you very much for your attention, for the invitation, and I'm happy to take questions. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we have some questions already. So I'm going to, before I start asking the questions, for those of you who um, may have just started um, to join, may have joined a little bit after the announcements, um, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you, or you can ask the question by typing it into the Q&A box. So our first question is from Natalia Kachanova, and she says, great talk. And um, she's asking if you've tried to add fact to the fall to uh, nucleosome complex? Well, I think that will be something something very interesting, especially in the light of uh, Caroline Luga's recent structure, where she also had a partially uh, disassembled nucleosome or just made a subnucleosome essentially. So I think this will be something very exciting to look into in the future. Definitely. Um, I'm going to uh, unmute uh, Jason Fan. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Very, very cool talk. Um, I was about uh, curious about the the chat four, um, uh, CHD four. Uh, so I guess um, you know they, they, they've done biochemical studies saying that, it, and it's, it kind of seems to slide like nucleosome, just like uh, CHD one. But you do see that difference with the the lifting of the DNA, and so I was wondering, like, um, you know, what kind of like. Um, like mechanistically wise, like if, is that lifting um, necessary or um, it seems that like it doesn't seem to affect sliding um, that much. Um, I was wondering what your thought on that is. So I think mechanistically speaking, the unraveling of the nucleosomal DNA is not necessary because we also have data where, or data from other labs as well as ours, that when you just have the ATPase motor, you can still to some degree, at least remodel a nucleosome, right? So um, it probably has, this unraveling probably has a different function and maybe recognizing factors that are sitting in front of the nucleosome and so on. And this becomes especially, I think, also interesting in the context of the polymerase, where if you had an incoming polymerase and the DBR sits there, the DNA binding region gets displaced and then only activates. Um, so I think the unraveling is still a little bit unclear. Um, we interpret it in the context of Pol2 NCP with CHD1, maybe that this unraveling makes it easier for polymerase to transcribe in, into the nucleosome um, because you don't have to break so many contacts um, with, uh, with the histone octamer. I see, thank you. 
Great. So um, we'll take one more question before we move on to the next speaker. Uh, so this question is um, Jillian Clifford. I'm, I unmuted you so you can go ahead and ask. Maybe is it working? Hmm. Melvin, can you try unmuting Jillian? Oh, because I'm not sure if it's working. <laughs> Yeah, I think she just needs to also, she or he needs to accept that they want to be unmuted because I still see it. Yeah. Uh, but if we cannot get to the question, maybe they can also write it. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I guess um, we'll go ahead and move to the next talk. Um, Jillian, if you wanna type your question in, in the Q&A box, um, we can get to it um, during or after and at the end. Um, or yeah, so I will leave this to Melvin. 